The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. I'm delighted to be here, and I'd like to thank all of you who have dialed in today. I just completed a six-year term on the NIH Council of Councils, where we uh, provided guidance and advice to the NIH director. One of the key priorities of NIH is to make scientific discoveries to improve health and promote health equity. The National Institutes of Health is where we receive a lot of our research funding recognizes that there are certain populations, certain communities that experience disparities in health outcomes. And it's so important to understand and address the causes of these differences to make sure that we have uh, the, the correct interventions um, and achieve health equity. Health equity is a goal of the NIH as well as UC San Diego. And it's defined as the principle underlying the continual process of ensuring that all, individual, all individuals, all communities have optimal opportunities to attain the best health possible. One measure about uh, of health uh, quality is the life expectancy. So what you'll see here, this is from the Centers for Disease Control, you see these obvious disparities in life expectancy where Asian Americans in the US tend to live up to 84 years of age, However, American Indians and Alaska Natives, their life expectancy is only 65 years. And for Blacks and African Americans, it's about 71 years. How do we close this gap and ensure that all the communities have access to a long and healthy life? Some of the most common uh, conditions that occur as we age include uh, falls, includes depression, dementia, cardiovascular disease. But what I'd like to emphasize is type two diabetes. And you see an image of the pancreas here. So uh, diabetes uh, occurs when your body does not produce enough insulin or doesn't use insulin properly. And type 1 diabetes was uh, previously referred to as juvenile onset diabetes. It's an autoimmune condition. And the only uh, management is by supplementing insulin that your body is unable to produce. Type 2 diabetes usually occurs as we age, usually at the, the onset starts uh, at about 45 years of age and occurs largely due to insulin resistance. Your pancreas may produce enough insulin, but, uh, your, but insulin is not used properly. So there are countless studies that have shown that type two diabetes can be prevented with lifestyle changes and can be managed with, uh, with different medications. Currently there are 38 million Americans or one out of 10 Americans who have diabetes. And of those about 5% have type one, and 95% have type 2 diabetes, the what's often referred to as a more preventable form. And then 98 million have prediabetes. So uh, they're on the cusp of developing uh, type 2 diabetes. And you'll notice on the table to the right here that that risk increases among people who are over the age of 65. So among Americans who are 65 years of age or, or older, one out of four have diabetes compared to just 3% among people under the age of 44. What's also important is um, about 5% of people over the age of 65 are unaware that they have diabetes. You'll see the changes in the last 20 years. 
The gray areas represent uh, states and counties where the prevalence of diabetes was only about 4% to 6%. And then you'll notice in 2021, a lot of the, the areas, especially in the South, have increased uh, their diabetes prevalence to about 11 to 18%. So anyone, anywhere from one out of 10 to one out of seven people in those areas that are marked in black have uh, type two diabetes. And that's occurred with the concomitant epidemic of obesity. So about one out of three Americans are obese. You'll see in this map that some states like California and Colorado, um, one fourth of the individuals in, in these states um, have uh, low, lower uh, obesity prevalence compared to states in the South. So it's the obesity epidemic that's fueling the current diabetes epidemic. How does it look like globally? When I share this slide with my students, they seem they're very surprised. They didn't expect that the Asian countries in the Western Pacific region, that includes the Pacific Islands, the countries in purple, that they have um, so many diabetes cases, but they also tend to be very populous nations. But even in China, where the rate per capita of diabetes is similar to Mexico, You'll notice that in Europe and the United States, in North America and the Caribbean, there are only less than 60 million cases. And the emerging uh, places are in the Western Pacific and in Southeast Asia, with, um, that includes India. So who's at risk for diabetes? There are eight recognized risk factors we talked about aging uh, at over the age of 40, being a couch potato, having an inactive lifestyle, high blood pressure, gestational diabetes, that's diabetes during pregnancy that tends to resolve after the baby is born. But women who have gestational diabetes, their risk of developing type two diabetes increases about 20 years later so that half of women who had gestational diabetes as young mothers will go on to develop type 2 diabetes 22 years later. The other risk factors include a family history. Of course, there's a genetic component, um, impaired glucose tolerance, that's prediabetes, having high cholesterol levels, and having a body mass index that's greater than 23. So usually, so what is, what is the body mass index? It's um, a, a very convenient estimate of obesity. When you go to your doctor's office, they'll measure your weight and height. You could uh, go online and just type in BMI calculator. And the definition of clinical obesity is a BMI greater than 30 kilograms per meter squared. The definition for overweight is a BMI greater than 25. And in this case, somebody who is five foot four, 65 year old woman, five foot four, 134 pounds has a BMI of 23. So that's still considered normal. And why do we want to prevent or delay diabetes? Because diabetes comes with multiple microvascular and macrovascular compli complications. Uh, including retinopathy, uh, affects your vision, kidney dysfunction, cardiovascular disease, um, and, and as well as cognitive function and neuropathy. So you'll see in this chart, the women and men with diabetes that's represented in the dark blue and the dark green lines have significantly more coronary heart disease compared to women and men in yellow and light blue who don't have diabetes. You still see that increasing risk once they reach 65, but it's significantly more prominent, especially among men with diabetes represented in the green line. So why should we be concerned about health disparities in San Diego? That's because San Diego County is very diverse. These are the latest census data where 
about 60% are people of non-European descent. But this also allows us a great and rich opportunity to try to understand the risk factors for different uh, chronic conditions in our diverse communities. So among Latinos are the largest uh, racial ethnic group followed by Asian Americans. This article was published um, over 10 years ago and it was based out of hospital data from Northern California Kaiser Hospitals, which is generally representative of, of uh, Californians. And this shocked the medical community. Whenever I ask our medical students, name the three groups with the highest rates of diabetes, they generally answer incorrectly. They generally uh, assume that Latinos, African Americans, and Native Americans have the highest prevalence of type 2 diabetes. However, this Kaiser data showed that among their 2 million members, it's actually Pacific Islanders, and San Diego has the second largest Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian community outside of Hawaii. Filipinos came second, and South Asians came third. Filipinos are among after Mexican Americans, Filipinos are the second largest immigrant group in San Diego. What's also interesting, if you look at the other Asian subgroups, Southeast Asians, people from Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Japanese, Vietnamese, Koreans, and Chinese in Northern California had higher prevalence of type 2 diabetes compared to whites. And in the slide, what you'll see is the um, body mass index, and that's represented, you'll see the orange line, and that represents the cut point of, um, of obesity, a BMI of 30. And you'll notice that among people without diabetes, the black lines, they're as expected below the obesity line. But if you look at people, people with incident diabetes, newly diagnosed, and they're represented by the gray graphs, and those who with prevalent diabetes in white, they're all above the obesity cut point, which makes sense. And they're above uh, the obesity cut point for whites, African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, and Pacific Islanders. But for Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, and South Asians with, with diabetes, they're all below the obesity line. And when you look at complications of diabetes, you also see differences by race ethnicity. So anything to the right of that vertical line uh, with a one at the bottom um, x-axis represents a higher risk compared to the referent group of white adults in Kaiser. So you'll notice that Pacific Islanders had a significantly higher risk for myocardial infarction compared to whites. And you see that everything else to the left, African-Americans, Latinos, Chinese, Japanese, and Filipinos all had a lower risk of myocardial infarction. There were no um, excess risk among any of these groups with regards to congestive heart failure or stroke. Um, a lot of it depends on the duration of follow-up. But then when it came to end-stage renal disease, these are usually patients who are on uh, dialysis, you'll notice that all of the Asian subgroups, um, except for South Asians, people from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, had a higher risk for a kidney disease. So Kaiser repeated uh, this analysis in 2016, and the same trends persisted where Native Hawaiians, Filipinos, and South Asians, about one out of three had type 2 diabetes among men and women. The Centers for Disease Control predicts that by the year 2050, one out of three of all Americans will have type 2 diabetes. Among Pacific Islanders, Filipinos, and South Asians, we're already there. And you'll notice, again, among Southeast Asians, Vietnamese communities, Japanese, Koreans, and Chinese, their rates of diabetes 
released eight years ago, still exceeded that of whites, despite having a lower BMI, despite um, having lower rates of obesity. So is, there, is that something unique to California? We had the opportunity to work with uh, using national data. This is the NHANES data. And when you categorize Asians together in blue, it looks like their rates of diabetes were just slightly lower than non-Hispanic Blacks. But when you disaggregate the Asians, you'll see that the rates were highest among South Asians, people from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Southeast Asian. In this case, the, the, most of the participants were Filipino, but 14% among Chinese. And that was, the previous slide was suggested by age and sex. This time we adjusted according to, by BMI as well. So even if you adjust by body size, that's when you see that Asians have higher rates of diabetes compared to groups that are traditionally perceived to be at highest risk. And when you disaggregate Asians, you'll see that Southeast Asians, in this case, Filipinos, followed by South Asians have the highest risk. And Chinese had even higher diabetes risk compared to non-Hispanic Black and Hispanics. So is this all uh, a result of fast food or changes in our diet or changes in obesity? We looked back at the literature and we found um, the earliest publication was published over almost 60 years ago. It was published in JAMA and it was based out of Hawaii where they uh, sampled over 30,000 people. And this was at a time when Hawaii had an agricultural um, industry and a need for workers who were agricultural workers and uh, used to these conditions. But this also included a lot of office workers. And you'll notice that even as far back as 60 years ago, diabetes per thousand was seven among whites, twice that among Chinese, and then three times that among Koreans, Japanese, and Filipinos, and over seven times that rate among Native Hawaiians. So what was reported in Kaiser and what we published um, using national data was already observed in Hawaii 60 years ago. And in uh, 1997, so um, 30 years after that initial study, this was done at the Big Island of Hawaii in North Kohala, and what you'll see um, are the BMI of the different racial ethnic groups. So whites and beige, they had a BMI of 25. So that's right at the beginning of uh, the definition of obesity, very similar to the BMI of Japanese and green, similar to uh, Filipinos and orange, and BMI was largest among native Hawaiians. So their mean BMI was already beyond 30, higher at the definition of clinical obesity. So one would expect Native Hawaiians to have the highest prevalence of diabetes, and that diabetes prevalence would be the same for whites, Japanese, and Filipinos. Instead, you see similar trends to what was published 60 years ago. The diabetes prevalence for whites was only 4%, but um, was about five times higher among Japanese and Filipinos and similar to Native Hawaiians. So a lot of these uh, discordant expectations where populations with low BMI have high diabetes risk prompted the American Diabetes Association to invite uh, people who had cohorts of Asian Americans to evaluate the screening guidelines for diabetes. And we're glad that uh, my colleagues and I were able to um, make recommendations to lower the screening BMI cut point for Asian Americans. And this was back in 2015. And we pooled all of our data together. This included the Masala study of South Asians in San Francisco and Chicago. Most of them were uh, software engineers in Silicon Valley. The Japanese Seattle uh, Diabetes Study that's led by Dr. Will Fujimoto, 
the North Kohala study in Hawaii, we pulled all of uh, the data together and our own study here, the UC San Diego Filipino Health Study. And what we found is that using the old guidelines of just screening people who were considered overweight with a BMI of 25, we would miss one out of three Asians with type two diabetes. That includes a woman with a BMI of 16. She's five foot four, weighed 94 pounds, and was diagnosed through our study as having type 2 diabetes. So thin isn't always uh, healthy. Um, these are the guidelines as of 2015. So if you um, have a BMI of 25, uh, back then you should be screened. We were able to change that to a lower BMI cut point of 23 kilograms per meter squared for Asian Americans. So why is there such a difference? 20 years ago, Dr. Yudkin and, with the, um, and Dr. Yajnik the, uh, published this paper in Lancet. So we have Dr. Yudkin with the glasses and of European descent and Dr. Yajnik who is South Asian, at, they have identical BMIs, 22.3, which is still considered normal. Some might even think it's underweight. But then when they did DEXA scans to enumerate their body fat, you'll see that the South Asian physician had twice the body fat of the European physician. So could that be a clue then that even with the same BMI, South Asians have more body fat? And what we did right here at the Stein Institute of Research and Aging was uh, we have, um, these are selected UC San Diego longitudinal studies. The first was started in 1972. It's the Rancho Bernardo study that was led by the late Dr. Elizabeth Barrett Connor, who was such a, um, a generous mentor to me, but she had uh, such foresight and recognize the importance of looking at diverse communities. So back in 1972, the role of lipids in relation to heart disease was still unknown. So she started the Rancho Bernardo study, and we've been following those 6,000 participants for about 50 years. In 1994, she recognized that um, most of the participants, 99% in the Rancho Bernardo study were of European descent, and that their findings weren't applicable to the rest of San Diego. So in partnership with Dr. Wilma Wooten, who is our current uh, medical officer for the County of San Diego, started the health assessment study of African-American women. And she also noticed that most of our patients in the dialysis units at the VA hospital were thin Filipino men. She was baffled because they were in the Navy, they had access to healthcare, they had to exercise as a requirement for staying fit in the Navy, and um, yet why were they diagnosed with diabetes only after manifesting kidney disease? So the objectives were to compare the prevalence of and risk factors for several chronic diseases, including type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and osteoporosis among Black, black white, and Filipino women. We did that at baseline, and we followed them five years later and 10 years later. So here's an example of, we enrolled about 450 women. Five years later, we invited the healthiest uh, participants, and these were women without any cardiovascular disease five years after the baseline visit. So we had about 200 in each group. And what you'll notice in bold base are the, um, the healthy outcomes. So among the three groups, Filipinas were significantly younger, 64 years of age. They had the, the highest college attainment. And many times when um, there are observations of health disparities. Some of the reasons tend to be attributed to differences in social and structural determinants of health, whether that's, that pertains to health access, health literacy. But in this case, uh, Filipinas half were college graduates, 
that's consistent with college attainment of immigrants here. One third were nurses, so they had very high health literacy. And Dr. Wooten uh, recruited participants from the health department as well as San Diego State. So 45% had college degrees. Filipinas were healthy. They didn't smoke, only 13% compared to half of black and white women. Um, they didn't drink. I don't, I don't drink well. I, I don't metabolize alcohol well. So only 1%, I think they were the three women who were U.S. born, um, drank a, an alcoholic beverage about uh, three times a week compared to white women uh, who 62% had an alcoholic beverage three times a week. And then exercise was very similar among the white and Filipina women, slightly less frequent among black participants. So just looking at this, one would expect Filipinas to have the healthiest outcomes. We measured um, fat, regional fat around the waist, around the waist-hip ratio, we had DEXA scans because we were interested in osteoporosis and it allowed us to measure body fat as well as truncal fat in the abdominal region. And what you see bold-faced is that Black women had the largest BMI, the largest waist girth, the most truncal fat using a DEXA scan, and the most body fat whereas white and Filipino women had similar anthropometric markers. You would expect Black women to have the highest rates of diabetes, and diabetes rates you would expect to be similar among white and Filipino women. Instead, it was highest among Filipinas, intermediate among Blacks, and lowest among whites. So again, the CDC predicts, like right now, one out of 10 Americans have type 2 uh, diabetes, the, the CDC predicts that one out of three will have type 2 diabetes in 2050, but among Filipinas, we're already there. So what is accounting for this excess risk? In this follow-up study, we were interested in looking at quarter, coronary artery calcium. So we did these measures with a CT scan which also allowed us to measure visceral adiposity. So this is an image, you see the belly button on top, the navel on top, and then the spine down below. This is a six millimeter slice between the L4 and L5 vertebrae. And the red areas represent this harmful visceral adipose tissue. So on your left, you see an image that belongs to a 60 year old black woman with a BMI of 25, she's uh, considered overweight, five foot seven, 160 pounds. But look at her, the red areas, look at her visceral fat, it's only 25 cubic centimeters. You compare that to a 69 year old Filipina woman, and her BMI is 20, so that's considered you know, even underweight, five foot four, 115 pounds. But look at the red area. She's loaded with visceral fat, eight, about three times the volume compared to the Black woman who might be misclassified as overweight. When I show this slide to our medical students and I ask them, if all you had was their BMI, their weight and their height, what would you tell the Black participants? And they almost always say, watch your weight, exercise more. And what would you tell the thin Filipino woman? Good job, um, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. So you could replace that Filipina label with Japanese, Korean, and Chinese. And this participant with a BMI of 20 had a 26 inch waistline. So the question is, how do you, what, what, uh, causes the accumulation of visceral adiposity in Asian communities. And on a practical level, how do you get rid of it? Because it's intra-abdominal, like it can't be removed by, by liposuction. And who would do that in a participant with a 26 inch waistline? And what we found was that when we, with the CT scans, that Filipinas had significantly more visceral adipose tissue while Black women had the least. 
And among our Black participants, they had more subcutaneous fat that's under the skin, usually in the hip area. And that also raises the, the concern about maybe Black women are misclassified as being at risk if it's just based on BMI. They have the least visceral fat. And it turned out in this cohort, they had the best, the lowest cholesterol levels. So I think this emphasizes the importance of sometimes with medicine, one size doesn't fit all. And the, um, and the definitions of what a healthy body size or body type needs to consider all of the components, especially when it comes to regional fat. So what we looked at was, let's just look at uh, participants with a normal BMI. So that meant the Asians, the Filipinas with a BMI less than 23, and Black and white women with a BMI less than 25. And you'll see in the yellow line that Black women had the least visceral adipose tissue compared to either white or Filipino women. And this has been replicated among Black diaspora communities in England, as well as in the Caribbean and in Brazil. So what is it that uh, protects Black women from accumulating visceral adipose tissue, yet uh, causes visceral, and what are the reasons for visceral fat accumulation in Asian communities? So we also observe that with Filipinas, they accumulate pericardial fat, fat around the heart, and fat around the rectus uh, abdominis. We compared our data to other studies, the MESA study, the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, and the Masala study, mediators of um, atherosclerosis among South Asians living in America, and found similar trends. So if you look at um, graph A, you'll see that African-Americans had more subcutaneous fat, similar to our observations. And in graph B, South Asians and Chinese Americans had more visceral fat, uh, while African-Americans in their, among their participants had the least. Uh, we also notice that in graph um, C, South Asians had more intermuscular fat, and that translates to more inflammation. And then in graph D, similar to our observations, Chinese Americans had more pericardial fat, fat around the heart. And with um, in terms of uh, liver fat, there was uh, lower hepatic attenuation, which translates to more liver fat among South Asians. So why should we be concerned about visceral adipose tissue? So fat is not just a place where you store your excess calories, it's actually an active endocrine organ. So in the presence of visceral fat, what happens is you have more inflammation, you have more IL-6, more tumor necrosis factor alpha, um, and, and that was observed in our cohort where Filipinas had more IL-6 compared to both groups. And what's important also is when in the presence of visceral adipose tissue, adiponectin is downregulated. So you want adiponectin levels to be high because it has it plays an important role in glucose homeostasis. There are studies among Native Americans that showed that Native Americans with low adiponectin levels who are more likely to develop type 2 diabetes. A study of physicians in, um, in Boston showed that lower adiponectin was, also, was associated with a risk of developing my, myocardial infarction seven years later. And we looked, at, the question was, do adiponectin levels differ among our three ethnic groups? We only looked at those with normal glucose levels, removed all those with diabetes and prediabetes, and sure enough, adiponectin levels were lower among Black and Filipino women compared to whites. There was a study at the University of San Carlos in the Philippines that identified a polymorphism um, with the adiponectin gene. So it looks like 
there is a genetic component that explains some of the lower levels of adiponectin, at least in Filipinos, but it also uh, identifies a potential um, opportunity for screening. So instead of uh, glucose or insulin levels, adiponectin might be an opportunity to um, screen people with diabetes. Another, I would mentioned uh, gestational diabetes, that women who are pregnant and have gestational diabetes, 20 years later, half of these women will develop type 2 diabetes. Kaiser has um, published this. Usually, women who are overweight or obese during pregnancy are at higher risk for gestational diabetes, but as you'll see, it's the Asian pregnant women who had the highest rates of gestational diabetes uh, with the Kaiser data and Hispanics, Blacks, and Whites who tended to have higher BMI as pregnant women um, had lower rates of gestational diabetes. These were some of the other um, factors that contributed having more, more than six children, low muscle to total abdominal ratio, insufficient sleep. I mentioned um, a third of our Filipino participants were, were nurses and shift workers tend to have disrupted sleep, which, which uh, increases your risk for cardiovascular disease and other um, components, including hypertension, lower education, childhood and adulthood social disadvantage, and family history. There was this, um, aside from gestational diabetes, there is concern that type 2 diabetes risk starts at infancy. And this paper was um, among South Asians. And some of the uh, well-developed studies in this field started um, among participants in the Dutch hunger winter family study. In, during World War II, the roads were blocked. So food that was usually delivered to the Netherlands were blocked. The people there experienced severe um, famine during the winters of 1944 and 1945. And what happened or what they observed was that babies who were exposed to prenatal malnutrition, their moms were only consuming about 400 calories during the winters as they, as 60 year olds had higher risk of cardiovascular disease compared to babies who were in the last trimester of pregnancy um, during the summers. And so um, there's an example here of Audrey Hepburn because she was a 16-year-old who weighed 80 pounds, um, and she mentioned that during the Dutch hunger winter um, famines, they would crush tulip bulbs in an effort to make it into flour. So what are the implications of prenatal malnutrition on other communities that are experiencing war or are not having access to food. Some of the mechanisms include a low protein diet, um, alters mTOR expression, which affects insulin secretion. Um, there are also studies that have shown that maternal undernutrition puts you at higher risk of accumulating visceral adiposity. In, in our cohort, uh, Dr. Langenberg wanted to see the association between diabetes and coronary heart disease from a life course perspective. So the women in our, in our study were born in the 40s, and this was at a time during the Japanese occupation. My grandmother said that she would walk around with like big bags of Japanese yen, but there was no food to purchase in Manila. But in the Southern Islands, people were able to fish for food and we didn't have information on maternal nutrition, but you're able to estimate the leg length. So it's the difference of your standing height and your sitting height. And the length of your leg is usually a good estimate of childhood malnutrition. And in fact, what we observed is that among our, our participants who were born before the Japanese occupation were about two centimeters taller than women who were born uh, during World War II. And what we found indeed 
was that women in with the shortest leg length in orange had a threefold higher risk of having coronary heart disease compared to women with the longest leg length. So assuming that um, the, the women with the shorter leg length experience childhood malnutrition. What are the other factors that seem to contribute to excess visceral fat accumulation? Having lots of children, I'm the youngest of seven, and um, the, you'll notice here that BMI remain the same whether you had one or two kids or six to 12 kids, but look at the visceral fat. Visceral fat started to increase if you had three to five children. So even though BMI did not differ, that increased with higher parity. Um, also wanted to mention the importance of abdominal um, muscle. And so we might not be able to persuade a, an Asian participant with a 26 inch waistline that she needs to lose weight, but maybe increasing muscle mass might be an effective intervention to improve insulin sensitivity and prevent or delay insulin resistance. And what about sedentary behavior? So physical activity benefits everyone. There's been some discussion that sitting is the new smoking. And you'll notice that, so who sat the longest? Um, in this case, it was white women in blue sat the, the longest, about 40% uh, sat more than four hours. And Filipina women uh, sat the shortest amount of time. They mostly less than two and a half hours. And I think because they were younger um, and I think still in the workforce, especially as nurses where you're walking around so much. And um, what happens when you sit too much? It looks like there is a higher risk for fat around the heart and intrathoracic fat, but not visceral fat. I think I'd mentioned these uh, other risk factors before. We um, are one of 25 clinical sites in the diabetes prevention program. I have the privilege of being the co-PI along with Dr. Sunder Mudalier of the UC San Diego site. And you'll see that even if you have a low BMI, the benefits of reducing progression from prediabetes to type two diabetes is very high with lifestyle interventions. So in summary, regional adiposity, especially visceral fat accumulation, varies by race, ethnicity, understanding the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes and interventions to prevent or delay type 2 diabetes in diverse populations is necessary. Inclusivity in clinical trials and studies is important to achieve health equity and healthy aging. I'd like to encourage all the audience members to please Include all of your friends um, who, especially those who are from diverse communities, to join the clinical studies. Uh, as I mentioned, the DPP study showed that by being physically active 150 minutes a week and losing 7% of your current weight could reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes by as much as 71% for people over the age of 60. Our future direction, so um, as one of 25 clinical sites, for the next five years, we're going to be looking at Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's uh, disease-related dementia. The key questions are, what are the determinants and the nature of cognitive impairment among people with prediabetes and type 2 diabetes? So we are in our 28th year follow-up um, with a DPPOS study. And what's beautiful is that we still have 3,000 uh, participants and 50% are were recruited intentionally to have diversity, half are of non-European descent. So that would help us um, understand uh, any differences in pathophysiology. These are some of the um, goals that we want to uh, achieve with the current funding cycle also just wanted to acknowledge our funding uh, sponsors and collaborators. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Araneta, for such a fantastic talk. Um, okay, first question for you, Dr. Araneta. It'd be interesting to know what the demographic breakdown is that we're living in Hawaii when the initial research was done. 
So the initial research in, in the 1960s, I, I don't know, but um, currently Hawaii is about 70% Asian or Pacific Islander. But I think what's, but regardless of the demographic uh, characteristics back then, the reports of diabetes were stratified according to each of the um, different Asian and Native Hawaiian subgroups. And here's a question about Jardians. Um, why not give Filipinas Jardians that would decrease type 2 diabetes as well as cause weight loss and decrease BMI? What are your thoughts? Um, I think if there is no need to lose weight, to decrease BMI, to lose weight, I think that might be um, counterproductive, especially for the example I provided, the woman who's five foot four and 94 pounds mm. and newly diagnosed with diabetes. We know that from the DPPOS study, metformin, metformin is very effective in delaying the progression from prediabetes to type 2 diabetes. It worked wonderfully for people with a BMI of 30, but it only, but, but really wasn't effective in the DPPOS study among thinner people with low BMI and also was not effective in the Dashing study in China. So, but these are important questions to look at what are the difference in um, responses to medication. Okay, great. Thank you for that great response. Okay, here's another question. Are payers like IE insurance companies aware of this data? What best practice interventions are you seeing in healthcare practice? I think just screening. And uh, previously, with myself included, when I asked for uh, a two-hour oral glucose tolerance test, the response was, no, you're, you, you're not overweight. You don't need it. And I had to explain that, well, my father, and who's a physician, my grandmother, who's a dietitian, both had type 2 diabetes with BMIs of 22. But I think there's this awareness that um, diabetes can, can come in different sizes and, um, and that screening is convenient and easy to administer. Fantastic. Okay. Could excess visceral fat among Filipinos and other Asians be related to their diet, specifically high rice consumption? We tried to do that. So in our sample of 450 women, we tried to divide the rice eaters versus no rice eaters. And we had zero people in the group of non-rice eaters. So we didn't have a comparison group. Um, that, wow. Yeah. Well, they all ate rice. And yes. so I think I think the best way to, to evaluate this is to is a feeding study where you actually provide yeah. the food. Mm -hmm. And um, but we don't know that people have been eating rice for thousands of years. There's some uh, concern that um, maybe the way rice is processed uh, differently, um, and that's what's what's uh, causing you know some of the concern. It's an important question. Um, we have yet to to find a reliable and reproducible response. Okay, thank you. Um, what exercises can we do or should we avoid overdoing to promote the right balance? I think strength training. So mm -hmm. strength train strength strength training is is necessary to build muscle. And so muscle is very important. It helps with uh, insulin sensitivity. I, I think um, the emphasis on aerobic exercise for the purpose of weight loss um, is, is, is a message that's already been um, delivered, but I think strength training, especially in terms of protecting people over the age of 60 from frailty, from osteoporosis, provides multiple benefits in addition to aerobic exercise. Fantastic. Could high rates of diabetes among Black women in your study contribute to higher rates of Alzheimer's disease among older Black women? That's what we hope to understand in our new uh, cycle of the DPPOS study. There's often, um, there have been references to Alzheimer's disease as type three diabetes. And Alzheimer's rates are, in fact, um, higher among Black women compared to other racial and ethnic groups. But I think it's it's important to evaluate that now so that 
we can identify opportunities for early diagnosis and intervention. Okay, great. Um, and we have time for about one more question. Um, here's a great question. I'm curious to answer. How do we get rid of visceral fat um, or prevent visceral fat from accumulating? We don't know that yet. And I wish I, wish I knew the answer whenever we relay the um, results to our participants. That's always the top question. How did I get it? And how do I get rid of it? And um, so studies have been done among people of higher BMI. And in fact, weight loss does reduce visceral fat. But how do you reduce visceral fat in somebody with a 26 inch waistline? And if um, so, that's that's what's still unknown. And I think the balance then would be to increase muscle mass instead. Okay, so right back to your strength training answer. Yes. Yeah. And you okay. don't need heavy weights. I think the, the bands are, are efficient, but the benefits of strength training go beyond uh, type 2 diabetes prevention. Okay. Great. Well, I want to thank you personally for your fantastic talk, Dr. Araneta, and for the amazing, meaningful work that you're doing. What you're doing is groundbreaking stuff, and I'm so thankful that you're part of our team as an associate director and that you've taken the time to present your to present your data to all of our community. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And I think my thanks goes to the late Dr. Elizabeth Barrett Connor, who is just way ahead of her time. And that's really the, yes. yes. The, She's the, a pioneer in our field for sure. Absolutely. Recognizing that there were health disparities back then. And, and recognizing that uh, being in the dialysis center and why are these people in the Navy here um, if they're exercising? So I'm, I'm grateful I started my academic career at UC San Diego, that my office is in the Stein building um, and that I've had these opportunities that I might not have had anywhere else. Yeah, amazing. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time. I want to just remind everybody that the work that we do is, is supported entirely through donations, especially this amazing uh, lecture series. So there are lots of ways to support our work and lots of things that we do that require your support, our innovative research, training programs, and these fantastic community outreach programs. You can donate on our website at aging.ucsd.edu. You can use this um, QR code if you'd like. Um, and we are always, you know, excited to partner with all of you and hear what, what matters to all of you. So with that, thank you so much for your time tonight, Dr. Araneta. That was a fantastic talk, and we really do appreciate everybody being here to join us. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you.